Okay, uh, hi and uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, so I'll be presenting a finding on dating of manuscript using uh, image analysis and machine learning techniques. So primarily I'll be talking about data, then some computational methods that have been developed, uh, the retrieval application, I'll, I'll show you some screenshots, and finally some quantitative results. Okay, so for those of you uh, who are not familiar with me, I came all the way from Islamabad, and I'm grateful to Isabel for, for inviting me, and it, 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 it has been a real pleasure to, to meet experts from, from diverse, you can say, domains. Uh, I have been associated with the Faculty of Computing as well as the Vision and Learning Lab, uh, and we are also doing some collaborative projects with my, you can say, parent university in France. So primarily, uh, I work in image analysis and pattern classification with applications to video analytics, document forensics, and most importantly, uh, computerized analysis of handwriting. So uh, as a part of the efforts to develop computational methods for analysis of handwriting, we are targeting uh, multiple application areas, right? These include uh, recognition of cursive handwritten text. Then we have, uh, as you just saw, identification of writer, signature verification, Recently, we are also targeting hyperspectral document analysis, uh, specifically for signature verification. And then uh, there, there have been a couple of projects quite recently on prediction of neurological disorders from handwriting, as well as the development of, you can say, uh, like cognitive development in school-going children through analysis of their uh, sketches and handwriting. But uh, today, as I mentioned earlier, uh, restricting to the theme of the conference, I'll be presenting some of the findings on uh, classification or dating of uh, manuscripts. Okay, so uh, as it has been discussed over the last couple of days that uh, we do agree that uh, there has been an increase in the tendency to digitize the historical manu manuscript, right? And everyone sees that from, from their own perspective, right? On one hand, it is like preservation and accessibility of cultural heritage, but at the same time for people like us in computer science, it offers, you can say, um, a variety of challenging pattern recognition problem for which we can develop computational methods, right? And there are numerous projects which have been talked about, like the Monk system, the Dunhong project, and the Madon, the French uh, Graphem project, and Navido Mas, okay? So uh, from the perspective of, uh, you can say, computerized or computational methods, if we categorize these, uh, you can say, key problem areas, you have pre-processing, which includes, like, as it has been said many times, binarization. Then you have region of interest extraction, like if the document has illustrations, text, or other drop caps, you need to, to distinct distinguish between them so that you can process each part separately. And then, of course, you have segmentation into basic units of, of, of writing. Then you have retrieval and recognition uh, applications and also some high-level applications like identification of writers or the origin of the document, the date in which it was produced, and so on, right? So specifically talking about the dating problem, we do agree that uh, it requires extensive uh, domain expertise and somehow the intuition of, of, the, of the expert as well. So once we, we make an attempt to develop the computerized solution, the idea is to actually facilitate and not replace the, the, the main expert, right? Because all of these uh, computerized solutions, they, they try to give you a hit list to reduce the search space so that there's a manageable number of documents on which a domain expert can work. Okay. So for, for the dating, uh, one approach could be to date the document by identifying uh, the, the writer, right? That uh, if we know who has written the document, uh, it's easy to correlate with the active period of that particular writer and predict or estimate the date, right? But uh, the writer information is not always available or not always easy to get, right? So it makes more sense to use the writing style to actually uh, estimate uh, the date of the document. And all of the studies which are, you can say, exploiting writing style for this purpose, they are based on the hypothesis that uh, writing style undergoes a steady change over time, right? So this is the hypothesis of all the studies which, which actually exploit uh, style to estimate the date. And the, the classical framework is that you have a reference base where you have um, a set of uh, manuscripts with known, you can say, dates or some, some, some estimated uh, duration of the date. And once you have a question or a query document, you can match the writing style 
of, uh, with, with those in the reference bit, and then you can predict the date for the uh, query document. Okay, so for the data, uh, we primarily worked on, uh, on a set of uh, around 300 images, right? These were provided to us uh, within the framework of this project. So basically for this project, the target application, uh, it was more of a retrieval framework, just like it was presented in the, in the, in the previous presentation. So they were not uh, too much interested in the quantitative results, but a retrieval application where you provide an image as a query and you have to retrieve a hit list of all, uh, you can say, similar writings. Okay, then uh, since we were also interested in finding quantitative results uh, and we needed uh, some baseline with which we can compare, so we also used the MPS dataset, uh, thanks to Lambert and his team that uh, they, they made it available for us. So it has around, I think, 3,000 uh, charters and they are actually grouped into, uh, into clusters and the dates, uh, they are separated by quarters of a century with, with a margin of plus minus five years, right? Okay, so these are some, some illustrations from, from, you can say, the data set, which is divided into uh, 11 key years. Okay, now for the, for the features, uh, you see, uh, we have to capture uh, style somehow. It means you have uh, a writing sample, you have to represent it in a sequence of numbers, which, which actually captures the style. So important consideration in designing features is the scale of observation, as it was uh, mentioned uh, previously. You can compute features at a local level. Local level could be like a word, a character, or you can say a graphem. Then you can have a relatively distant scale of observation, like uh, just like patches, uh, or maybe small windows, which can be dense or sparse, depending upon how you sample them. And then you can have global features, which you can compute from the entire document, right? So uh, basically, uh, what, we'll, what I'll be presenting, so most of our features would be extracted uh, from patches. And again, it's a debate, well, what actually, how do you define a patch, right? So uh, you can say intuitively, uh, for me, a patch is like, say, three to four lines of uh, text with around two to three words, right? Because uh, it allows you not only to have the allographic shape, it also tells you the distance between characters or line spacing, distance between the words, right? But of course, this is debatable that it depends what you want to measure, and that actually dictates what, what actually should be a good patch size. Okay, so this you can say a simple windowing of the image. This is uh, sparse sampling, means there is no overlap, but you can also have dense sampling where you have windows which are overlapping, so you can, you can later on uh, extract feature from each of the patches independently. Okay, so the first feature, uh, as uh, uh, we know, is, uh, is the texture, and it, it, it has been, uh, you can say, incredibly effective in characterizing uh, images, right? Be it natural images or the hand-run sketches, and same is the case with the text, you see. Uh, for example, these are four uh, patches, and without even reading the text, uh, from a relatively distant scale of observation, we, we are able to tell that they are all different, right? Be, uh, whether they are handwritten or, or printed. So we exploit the same idea, right? And uh, we, uh, we extract small patches from the handwriting using, using some sampling. And first, as a baseline, we extract some, you can say, standard uh, textural measures, right? You can find the details in the literature. Uh, I, I'll not uh, go into the technical details. These are pretty conventional. And then we also extracted some textural information uh, from smaller scale of observation, like small components. And these components do not need to be perfect characters or words, right? Because we are not doing recognition. We just need a small, small you can say, unit of, of handwriting. So what we do is we position uh, small windows on, on top of uh, whatever we call a unit, a small unit, a small component, right? The window positioning itself is not random, right? There, there's, there's an algorithm which, uh, which actually positions these windows, but I, I'll skip those details. Now, within each window, what we do is we, we, we analyze the distribution of various directions at pixel level first, right? Now, what does that mean? That uh, you see, you can quantize the directions into four or eight uh, directions at pixel level. So, for example, say this is, this is, this is one patch which, which you see on the top, right? So within that, you see, okay, uh, what percentage of pixels contribute to a particular direction, right? And then you can, uh, for example, there are, there are four pixels in a given direction, which is like uh, around 9%. So we, we have divided the interval into 10 bins. So 9% is in the interval 0 to 10. 
right? So you will increment the bin, say, uh, five one of, uh, you can say, the, the two, you can call it like, you view it as a two-dimensional histogram. So you do it for, you can say, all the windows, and then you can normalize the distribution. So this distribution, distribution captures, you can say, the orientation information at a local level for, for, for each of the component. And then you see, instead of, once we are doing this, uh, it is a very low level feature, it means you are looking at pixel. Then we move a bit farther. That means that we estimate, you can say, uh, the, 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 the word or the component by, by a set of polygons, right? Uh, this is a standard algorithm which converts any shape into a polygon and you can control the number of points, right? For example, by changing some threshold, I can control how many points should be there in, in that polygon. Now, once you have the poly polygon, you can compute very nice features like distribution of slopes, distribution of curvatures, which, which is the angle which two lines are making. And you can also weight these uh, distributions by the length of the lines which are actually uh, contributing to, to the respective slopes or curvatures. Okay, so once you have these, we, we use them as a baseline. So uh, we, we then thought, okay, uh, le let's try how uh, uh, machine learned or automatically learned feature would, would work on that. So as uh, we have been continuously discussing that um, there, there is a problem that you, you don't have sufficient data, right? So in those cases, people have been using uh, models which have been trained on other data set, right? But the problem is that we are dealing with handwriting images and most of the models that you will find they are trained on real world images, right? So instead of directly using them, what we did was that um, we took those models and we, we collected as many writing samples of contemporary writings as we could, right? You know, there's a famous database, IM, uh, then there's RIMS, so we, we had like thousands of images. So taking those models as a starting point, first we fine tuned them to handwriting. Yes, uh, I understand it is very, these, di these images are very different from, from what we are dealing with. But still, it's, it's better to, to uh, they can better serve as a starting point rather than using those models which are trained on totally different images. So we are just changing the starting point, right? And once you have this starting point, so you can further tune these models with the data set which, with, 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 with which you are dealing, right? Which means you can, you can actually tune them to, 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 the, to, to, to the images of uh, MPS or the GraphM data set. Okay. So once we have the features, of course, uh, once you have the uh, textural features, you can combine them and then you can use any classifier to, to identify the, the class label, which is in this case is the key here. And in case of uh, uh, ConNet, you, you don't need a separate classifier. It, it will automatically give you the class label. Okay, so this is the summary of what is being done. Once you have uh, images, you extract small patches, right? Then you have the, the features and uh, the, the, the important point is that you will have a decision at the patch level. So what you can do is you can combine those decisions to, to a page level or a document level decision, uh, maybe by a majority vote or some, some other sophisticated, uh, you can say, combination uh, technique. Okay, so uh, this was the application uh, a screenshot for, for the retrieval where you can uh, give a query and uh, it will give you a hit list of... Uh, similar writings with, with some similarity score. Uh, there was also a web-based uh, version of this, right? Uh, in this image, the first image represents the query, and the subsequent images are, are, the, retrieval, uh, are the retrieved images from the database. Another important uh, factor that we included in this uh, was the relevance feedback, right? Where once you have a hit list, this is just for illustration purposes, uh, we, we ask the expert to assign a score of relevancy to each of the retrieved images, right? For example, if uh, you can say a score can be from minus three to plus three, depending upon how relevant each retrieved image is. So what happens is that, for example, suppose there are a couple of images which, which do not match with your query. So maybe the expert would assign a score minus three or minus two. So using those, that feedback, you can adjust the weight of different features so that you push these images below in the hit list, and you try get those images which are more similar, right? So this is something that, um, of course, it will involve some, some manual, uh, you can say, interaction where you have to assign a score to, to, to each uh, retrieved image, but the subsequent search would be, you can say, much better as it will push down those which are uh, not, not, not very relevant. Now, from, from the perspective of quantitative uh, 
results, we are using the same metric which, is, uh, which has been used uh, for, for similar studies, which is simply, uh, the error is simply, you can say the absolute difference between the ex estimated and the ground truth here, and we normalize it by the total number of, uh, you can say, images. There's also uh, a cumulative score where you find the percentage of uh, documents which are, uh, you can say, uh, classified or recognized with, the, with, the, with an accept table level of error k, right? Which is like 20 years, 25 years, whatever you choose it. Okay, so uh, on top you have, uh, you can say performance of uh, individual textural features, right? So we see uh, that uh, at patch level, naturally once you do the majority voting, you, you get some improvement, right, on page level. So in, in all the cases, it's, it slightly uh, improves the result when, once you combine the, all the decisions from various patches, right? So uh, when we combine different features using uh, some selection technique, right, the combination does not mean that we simply concatenate them. There is a, a proper selection mechanism. So the lowest uh, mean absolute error we achieved was around uh, 20, 20.1, uh, 20 right? So it's, it's around 20 years. Then for the machine learned features, right, uh, you see there's a, uh, there's a significant improvement where at page level uh, we are able to reduce the error to, to around uh, five years, right? And then uh, for the cumulative score, uh, with k equals zero or k equals 25 means that if there's an error of 25 years, we, we consider it correct, right? So with k equals 25, uh, for the two configurations, we have uh, the score of around 90 and 95%. Uh, so just to uh, compare machine learned features with textual uh, features, uh, he here's some, you can say, um, uh, numbers from, from the literature as well as from, from the features. So you see, um, in, in, in most cases, uh, you, you, you have comparable results, There's, except for the first one, which was uh, a work of 2014, but since then, uh, results have improved. So um, th there's not a very dramatic change uh, that, that, that you see. We are getting, you can say, good numbers with uh, automatic feature learning where you, you, you just let the learning algorithm decide what it feels is good for this problem, right? But again, as uh, yeah, it was pointed out that uh, what actually is, is it learning is, uh, can be questionable. So unfortunately, I don't have an image, but what we did was we tried to visualize different uh, feature maps to actually uh, see what, 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 what is it learning, right? But of course, uh, uh, there's not always a direct interpretation just by looking at the feature map. Sometimes it, it is meaningful, but not, not always, right? So you can actually say it is learning some, some specific curves or, or, or edges, right? But you cannot generalize it. So the best we can do is we can, uh, we can at, the, at the moment, we can just uh, find some interpretation of the feature maps which, which the network is learning, right? Okay, so... Uh, so basically, uh, you see there are uh, certain points I would uh, uh, like to stress on that um, I've already talked about uh, uh, the, 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 the dilemma of using machine learned feature, right? Uh, there's another point that uh, when you see style is something subjective, right? So once we are trying to learn the style, it can be debatable that how much text should be sufficient to learn the style, right? So there have been studies like they keep on reducing the amount of text that is available for training, right? So maybe uh, a complete page, a paragraph, three lines, two lines, one line, one word, right? So uh, for the writer identification problem, we tried this, right? Uh, there have been writer identification studies with, with single word as well, right? Uh, but uh, is it actually learning the style that is debatable, maybe the allographic shape because uh, so uh, for, for the style, personally, I feel that you at least need some, uh, you can say, sufficient text where you can, you can get an idea on word spacing, character spacing, line spacing, right? So, but, but, but that, is, that is debatable, okay? And another, uh, you can say, useful aspect is that uh, in, in such textural or machine learned uh, features, there's no script dependency, right? If you have to adapt it to a different script, you can, you just have to do some, some tweaking and, and uh, it is likely to work on that as well. But uh, as uh, we were discussing in, in some previous presentation that there are some cases when someone is writing in more than one script, right? So in those cases, uh, 
I think uh, it makes sense to use local features rather than uh, the global features, right? Because if you go for global textural measures, um, the scripts would look different. But if you, if you reduce the scale of observation, you analyze the small parts of writing, so uh, they can be common across multiple scripts. If I'm writing in French, I'm writing in Arabic, so maybe the way I make a gesture, that would remain the same. So for if, uh, if, if you want to do something on, on documents where you have uh, same writer but multiple script, so local or low level features, they are likely to outperform uh, relatively uh, distant scale of observation, right? Uh, so with that, I would like to acknowledge the two students who did this work. They, are, they were my master student. They have graduated now. And uh, for, for any details on this or other projects that we are do doing related to handwriting recognition or other relevant areas, you are welcome to visit uh, the website of our group. So thank you very much.